Okay, so at the end of um, the last video, we were talking about potential energy as a type of mechanical energy. And potential energy is energy that's stored in an object. And the way we can tell if an object has potential energy is if we release that object, if that object then moves, we'll know it had stored energy. The best example is imagine we were to go to the roof of a building and hold an object out over the edge of the roof, right? And if I'm holding the object out over the edge of the roof and someone says, hey, does that object have potential energy? If I release it, we know the object's going to move. And so, yes, it does. It has potential energy. Why is it going to move? It's going to move because gravity is going to pull it down. And that is our second type of mechanical energy. It's called gravitational potential energy. Okay? It's capital E with the subscript G for gravitational. Okay? Um, so when gravitational potential energy is when work is done on an object to move an object against gravity. So if I'm holding this object on the roof of the building, I need it to carry it up there. I need it to get it up there somehow. So I've had to apply a force to it and I've moved it a distance. And so I've done work on this object and as a result of me doing work on that object against gravity, because gravity doesn't want objects to go up, um, then that object has gravitational potential energy. So when I hold a book in front of me in my hand, it has a certain amount of gravitational potential energy, but then when I raise it above my head, it has more gravitational potential energy because I've raised it further above the ground. So the work I do, right, F delta D cos theta, the work is going to be equal to just mg. And the delta D is really going to be a delta H. And the cos theta, I'm lifting it against gravity, so the cos theta, uh, the the force I'm putting on and the direction that it's moving will be the same, so this will just become one, cos of zero. So then the work done is equal to mg delta hf minus hi. Okay, this mg delta h is the change in gravitational potential energy. So the change in gravitational potential energy is, I'm just writing it down here because I didn't leave myself space up there to box it, is mg delta h, where delta h is hf minus hi. But most times our hi will be zero. Like if we lift a book off the desk, we'll call the height of the desk where it started zero, and the final height of how high we lifted it. So usually mg delta h um, and MGH are, tend to be the same thing because usually our initial is zero. But what we're saying then here is, again, work done is equal to the change in energy. Okay? Um, so that's gravitational potential energy. There's a second type of potential energy that we're going to look at, and it's our third energy. It's called elastic potential energy. It's the energy that re that's stored in an object that has been stretched or compressed. So stored in an object that has been stretched or compressed. And as I'm writing this, I realize I didn't write anything up there for gravitational for you. Okay, I'll go back to that in a second. Um, think a spring, right? If I have a spring, maybe from a click pin, and if I take it and I put a force and I pull it outward, then this spring is stretched. And what's it going to do as soon as I let it go? It's going to zoom back in. It's going to move, which means it has energy stored in it. I could do the same thing. I could compress it. I could push it in, 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 in. And then as soon as I release it, it'll pop back out. 
okay? Um, could also be true of some of your clothing if it has some spandex in it, right? And you could stretch it, and then hopefully after you stretch it, it goes back to its original shape when you release it. Okay, before we go any further, gravitational potential energy is um, energy stored in an object and object as a result of doing work against gravity. As a result of doing work on it against gravity. Sorry, I should have written that down earlier. I did say it, I just didn't write it down. So for those of you doing your notes, okay? So energy stored in an object as a result of doing work against gravity. Work on the object against gravity. Whereas this is energy stored in an object that has been stretched or compressed. So you've done work. You've applied a force on the spring to pull it outward. You've done work on the spring to stretch it or compress it. Okay, now the amount that we've stretched this object or compressed this object um, is going to be directly proportional to the force applied. If you think about um, stretching a spring or stretching anything, when you first start to stretch it, it's easy. But the more you stretch it, the harder it gets to stretch it more. And what that means is that if you were to look at force versus the stretch, and we usually call the stretch the X, the stretch or the compress stretched, compressed. If we look at the distance stretched or compressed by the with uh, in comparison to the force, it goes like this. The more you stretch it, the more force you need to stretch it more. We say that it's directly proportional. And what this actually shows us is a law. It's called Hooke's, my, mark, my pen's dying, Hooke's law. Um, the slope of the line we call k, and the equation is f equals kx. You will also see f equals negative kx, and I'll talk about what, why they're a little bit different. This one is the force that I put on an object to stretch it. Okay, This one is the force that the spring puts back on itself to restore it. This is a restoring force. The spring doesn't like to be stretched, and so when I release it, it puts a force opposite the direction of the stretch to try to get itself back into original shape. So this is actually the force the spring is putting on itself, trying to get itself back together. This is the force I need to put on the object to stretch it out, where F is the force applied. course measured in newtons. X is the distance stretched or compressed. Course measured in meters. And K is known as the spring constant. I think in the chapters we're doing it's called the spring constant. Later on in the book, it's called the force constant, spring constant. And if you rearrange F equals KX for K, you'll see its units need to be newtons over meters. Now, the spring constant tells us about the spring, actually, right? The bigger, the heavy, more heavy duty the spring, the bigger the force we're going to need to stretch it, so the bigger the K will be. The smaller, if it's a spring from a click pin, the K is going to be pretty tiny, and so then we wouldn't need as much force to stretch it the same amount. So the K is a spring constant. It's constant for a given spring, but it changes from one spring to another. And the larger the spring, the larger the K, the larger, more heavy duty. Um, larger spring, larger K. So like the spring in the shocks of a car, it's going to have a really big K, whereas the spring in a click pin is going to be a really tiny K, right? Because it's going to determine how much force you need if X is the stretch or the compress is the same. So today's practice problems will with, be with Hooke's Law and with these guys, and tomorrow we'll get into equation for elastic potential energy.